לא חטאנו נעלי, אלוהינו מלך עולם, אשר כרשן במצוותיו וציוונו לסוג בדברי תורה. וערב נא אדוני אלוהינו את דברי תורתך בפינו בפי אבך בית ישראל, ונהיה אנחנו וצאצאינו וצאצאי אבך בית ישראל, כולנו יודע שמאחר ולומדי תורתך לשמע, ברוך אתה אדוני אנחנו לומדי תורה לאמור ישראל. אמן. ברוך אתה אדוני אלוהינו מלך עולם השיבה חבאנו מכל עמים ונתן לנו את תורתו. ברוך אתה אדוני אנו תן התורה. אמן. אמן. Okay, so seven, so we're going to be talking about oh, there we go. okay, talking about somebody who has a serious illness. okay. If either of the perspective and in relating to marriage, and it could be for business purposes as well, but this is mainly marriage, okay. If either of the perspective marriage partners has a major physical deficiency such as a serious internal illness, That is not generally discernible you are permitted to inform the other party however you must meet the following conditions a you must be certain that the, the khatan or kala is actually ill instances when he or she is merely weak by nature are not included in this category and such information should not be volunteered b you must be careful not to exaggerate the extent of the illness c you must be motivated by concern for the person you are, are warning, not by any consideration or of consideration of dislike for the other party. And D, if you feel they will marry despite your advice, you should refrain from mentioning the matter. Since nothing beneficial will, will emerge from your warning, it is forbidden. Okay. That's okay. Any discussion on that? Or we, because I'm going to continue with the next one. Um, I'm just trying to see anything to add to that guys um, yeah just one thing I wanted to ask you is that I think the thing that also should be added is um, one just like you delivered the message that we did before when you had a unfortunate experience with a supplier or a potential person that did the thing to inform them in almost a non-emotional way I think the what, best way to deliver it is first if you know that health condition you've got to make sure you've got you've got it relatively right and number two uh, if you do have it right you've you are not always the best one to deliver that message. So what I would do in a certain circumstance is I would sometimes phone the individual that's got that disorder. And I'd say, look, I'm in a difficult position here. I'm friendly with both of you. And I would have an obligation to realistically let, if, if I knew you were marrying somebody with a particular condition, you're my best friend, I have your back and I'd have to let you know of the seriousness of the situation. But you're also a friend of mine And I don't want to say this and jeopardize your chances with this lady. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to let you know that in two or three weeks, in this, roughly in this date, I'm going to inform her of the situation. I would like you to tell me the exact illness so that I could do research and mention it. Now, what I'd like you to do is mention it to her beforehand so that it doesn't come as a shock to her. I'm going to give you a few weeks of dating her because... There's some sort of emotional investment. You don't want to tell you on the first meeting, hi, I've got all these problems. You want to do it second date? So, <laughs> so in other words, after you've done a few and you're having a bit of a connection, because the truth of it is she might not like you. I know you, you're not the easiest person. She might not like you. She might like you, whatever. But the thing of it is after a few weeks, I'm going to have a chat with her because she's also a close friend of mine. And I would like you to be the first one to inform her so that when I inform her, Uh, it's not a shock and I'll just say I've discussed it with you you know about it I've known him for years he's healthy but just go to a medical professional with him so that you can sit down and check it out and the reason I'm saying that is he was so it happened this person said to me don't worry about it I'll tell them myself I said that's fine I'm telling them in two or three weeks so tell them yourself so it's not a shock when I do it don't interfere in the meantime 
this person had a psychiatric condition, which in some ways is far more difficult than a physical condition. Because a physical condition, it's difficult. You have to look after the person sometimes. But a psychiatric condition is much more serious because you're dealing with that person's unstable personality. Does that, yeah. does that make yes, sense? Yes, it's yeah. unpredictable. Physical, unpredictable. Whereby somebody who's physically ill, it's predictable, basically. You know more of the pattern. You know more, and it's structured, and it's, uh, you know, it's got a certain pattern that it goes through. The other one's completely unstructured uh, when it's, when it's a psychotic thing, you got no idea what to expect from that person, you know that type of. So it's a it's it's a much bigger problem. Correct, correct. So Kevin, I agree with you one hundred percent. Teach us the other thing, and then we'll start a new link with the. That's chair. why you can't post all these videos because sometimes we do sound psychotic. <laughs> all right, carry on. That's very funny. <laughs> I've got to finish by like twenty five past eleven. Eh? Okay, so should we okay. start with the Can someone at half past? Yeah, we can have it back to it's like what, uh, still 20 35 minutes, so it's fine. Okay, so let's get in the what do you mean? Still 40 minutes. You've got 40 minutes. All right. We need 40 minutes. So let's this one's a quick one. I'll be curious. It's it's, okay, it'll, it's so. one minute. Can I say it quickly? Sure. Okay. Uh, cautioning about apicorsis. If either of the prospective marriage partners has views that are apicorsis, you are obliged to notify the other party. The only condition here is that you must be personally acquainted with the knowledge that they hold such a view. If you merely heard this information from others, you may still notify the other party, but you must explicitly mention that you only know this from others, i.e. second-hand information. Okay. Uh, the Mishnah now concludes its explanation of the Muadim listed in the Mishnah 15b by elaborating on the final Mu'at case of man listed there. Man is always Mu'at. In other words, he always pays full for what he damages, whether he damaged something unintentionally or intentionally, whether he did the damage while awake or asleep, if he blinded the eye of his fellow or he broke utensils, he pays full damage. Okay. So uh, that's on 26A4. The Gemara notes that the Mishnah's grouping of two cases in its final clause is meant to teach us as an important law. The Mishnah states the case of blinding and breaking utensils together as a concept to teach us that the law for he blinded the eye of his fellow is similar to the law of broken utensils. Just as there in the case of utensils for the actual damage, yes, he pays, but for the four additional things he does not pay. So too, where he blinded the eye of his fellow unintentionally, for the actual damage, yes, he does pay. But for the four things, no, he does not pay. We explained that the, uh, you have Nezek Shalom, full damages for the actual damage. Then you've got pain. You've got medical costs. You've got convalescing, which is recovering, and the rates you paid according to your new position, as well as um, you've got for humiliation in certain cases. And those other things, you only pay for intentional damage, right? The Gomorrah inquires on 26B1 from, uh, and how do we know it's unintentional? Because the Mishnah states whether a man is sleeping or awake. So the very juxtaposition of talking about a man being sleeping uh, and mentioning in the Mishnah about an unintentional damage versus intentional and the statement of he pays uh, whether he damaged something unintentionally or intentionally uh, brings up the subject matter itself. Okay, so uh, 26B1, the Gomorrah inquires, from where are these things known? In other words, what is the scriptural source for the Mishnah's ruling that one must pay for the actual damage he inflicts, even if he injured the other person unintentionally? Okay, Chizkiah said, and so did a ton of Chizkiah's academy teach, the verse states a wound in the place of a wound. Now, I'm going to share this with you guys. Okay, just give me one moment, please. Yeah, an eye, uh, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, hand for a hand, foot for a foot, burn for burn, wound for wound, bruise for bruise. Okay. Uh, so there, there we, we discuss the changes. We also uh, discuss the change, by the way, which we're going to learn now in the uh, Gemara. 
If he knocks out the tooth of his slave, male or female, he shall let him go free on account of his tooth. Um, so obviously it's the same with the uh, eye. When a man strikes the eye of his slave, male or female, and destroys it, he shall let him go free on account of his eye. So it talks about the normal wounding with a normal person. And uh, obviously that you can no longer have the slave working for you if you damage their body part. That's the secondary part of the Gemara that we're going to go through. What I want to do is share this with you guys in connection with uh, Leviticus, Vayikra, chapter 24, verse 20. Um, so it says, if anyone maims his fellow as he has done, so shall be done to him. Fracture for fracture, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, the injury he inflicted upon another shall be inflicted upon him. Now, guys, what you can see there is this is what you call Gezei Rishava. What do we mean by Gezei Rishava? It's a classical case that aren't the mentioned before. It says, if a person shall maim his fellow. Now, that is a general rule. Now, if I maim a person, it means whether it's a tooth, an eye, or cause a wound, I'm responsible for that sort of damage. It then goes on below to mention those damage in specific um, body parts again. So if I say I'm going to maim my fellow, it's talking about everything. Now it's talking about specific. So it's repetitive. Then in Exodus, Shmot, it's again saying repetitively, a, a burn in the, uh, in the place of a burn, a wound in the place of a wound, etc., etc. And in the other place, it says a burn for a burn, a wound for a wound. So there's a lot of repetition going on. And when there's repetition, it means you don't need the repetition in order to expound. So you might say that you needed that repetition in, in Leviticus in order to expound uh, those particular cases because maybe in Vayikra it's talking about a different thing to Shmot. Kevin? Kev? Mm -hmm. It's talking about a different case of Shmot. <clears throat> Meaning if the context is different, it's not an open Gezei Rishava. You need the words for something. But when it starts off in uh, Vayikra, it says, if a person shall maim his fellow, that he has to make restitution, you don't then need to mention once you've done the uh, uh, the klalim, the generalities, you need to mention the specifics. That's how we know it's definitely free on that side. And it's free on that side in order to teach something on Shmot. And because those words are repeated in Shmot, it's free, it would seem on both sides, to teach us actual halacha. Okay, now that you guys have done the concept before, we can go straight on. So the verse states a wound in place of a wound, which comes to obligate him for what he does unintentionally as for what he does intentionally and for what he does unwillingly as for what he does willingly. So we explained a very good difference, but shoigeg is unintentional, what means a state of unawareness, meaning you didn't know it was wrong or you did it where you weren't aware of the uh, what you were doing. Those are the two examples. And um, is, uh, is, is is it is a, is a different term. Um, so we're talking about uh, aware and unaware, willing and unwilling. So we just said, what is the difference between being um, unintentional and unwilling? So what I'm saying is, say you've got a, you're a, I used this example the other day. It's just not uploaded. That's why I'm mentioning it again. You're an expert locksmith and you've got a, a locksmith business in uh, uh, Glen Hazel, whatever the case may be, and you can break and fix any lock. That's your business. Now, you've got some guy on Johannesburg Road that decides he wants to do a bank robbery, but he can't add two and two. So his chances of getting in the safe is not going to be very high. And he realizes that smashing it with a mallet is simply not going to work. So what he does is he kidnaps this person's uh, son uh, from school. He sees him walking backwards and forwards from school. And his friend says to him, you'll get your son back in one piece if you come and help us break in the safe when we gain access to the premises, I've got to... Now, is he unwilling? Yes. Does he know what he's doing? Absolutely. He's a safe expert. He knows how to get into a safe. So there the guy is unwilling, okay? But he is not doing it unintentionally. He's intentionally breaking in the safe in order to save his son's life and get his son back in one piece. Do you see the difference between unintentional and unwilling? Yeah. All right. 
so there's an example, and it does have a lucky <clears throat> ramifications. Anyway, the Gemara asks, but this superfluous expression is needed to impose payment for pain, even where there's actual damage. Okay, accordingly, is it not superfluous that to teach a person is always liable for the damage he inflicts? Okay, so what we're saying is here, look, I can understand that it seems to teach that there's some sort of concept that you have to pay for pain, not in any actual damage. So the Gemara responds, if so, I'll explain it now. So let me just repeat this. But this superfluous expression is needed to impose payment for pain, even where there's actual damage. Accordingly, it's not superfluous to teach that a person is always liable for damage uh, that he inflicts. So what it's saying is here, is that you would think that if you've paid for pain, that you don't necessarily need to pay for actual damage because you've kind of like already paid for the person or it's saying the opposite. It's got two different opinions here that if you've paid for the actual damage, you don't have to pay for pain. Does that make sense? In other words, you've paid, you've paid for the actual damage. Pain is a separate element and it doesn't have to be included. So we're saying we understand it could be a case of either or, but is it a case where you have to pay for both? It's not necessarily intuitive. So let me give you an example of where there would be pain, but no um, permanent damage. All right. Um, say, for example, Shame, it happened unfortunately with uh, uh, a family member I know that they were burning matric papers in a dustbin for hours, all the students. Okay. And what they did is they rested the foot on the dustbin for some reason, I don't know why, they were lying there and they just like rested, and it was like grilling a steak. All you heard was, shh, and that this the dustbin was like red hot, and, and they battled to put their foot off, their skin was still stuck to the dustbin. Now, they can walk today, yes, they're fine, but did they have pain? I must tell you, man, for weeks, this person couldn't walk properly, because you're always on that same foot. You know what I'm saying? Now, there was mm. actual damage. It's not permanent. So the halachic definition of damage is if it renders the person permanently damaged. If it's temporary, uh, it's not the same. It's not the same at all. It's rendered a temporary setback. Does that make sense? So here we're saying that: Do you pay for the actual pain? If you fail to inform somebody that you've been burning matric papers for two two hours and that dustbin was red hot, you should inform the person not to come near that dustbin instead of grilling their flesh like a um, a steak. So therefore, you'd pay for pain, and depending if there was permanent damage, you'd pay for damage. So we're saying we understand the payment for pain. What we don't understand is, do you pay for pain and actual damage? That's the question right now. All right. The Kimura answers, if so, that's a superfluous verse that was needed only to teach that there's payment for pain, even where damage is paid, then let the verse write the following. Why don't you just write the verse, a wound for a wound? What is meant in place uh, of a wound? In other words, why do you need the additional wording, which is tachat uh, patsa? In other words, in place of a wound. Why don't you just say a wound for a wound, like it says in Shmot? So learn from this, the superfluous verse, two things. That pain is paid even where damage is paid, okay? And that a person is always liable for the damage he inflicts. So the first note that we've got to do, and this is very, very important, guys, is that we've got to realize that uh, as far as damage is concerned, it's not obvious you have to pay for damage. How do we know it's not obvious? What is the biggest excuse in South Africa? I'm sorry, I didn't mean it. Like that's a magic wand that just because you'd never premeditated a car accident uh, three weeks in advance with a crack team of uh, project management specialists and you were dozy and on your phone and you cracked somebody's car, that all of a sudden, because you didn't mean to and it wasn't intentional, that you don't pay. There seems to be this concept in the secular Western world that if it's not premeditated, it's not your fault, which is absolutely not true. So even if you didn't mean it, and you didn't mean to hurt somebody, the fact of it is if you created damage, you have to pay Desik Shalom, full damages, full damages for the actual damage you caused. 
That's number one. So the, uh, the superfluous nature, we said we had two superfluous verses. The one, a wound uh, for a wound, and the other one, a wound in the place of a wound, because you've got the sourcing in Exodus and in uh, Leviticus, Vayikra, uh, Shmot and Vayikra. And we've got that whole general statement which says, if a person shall maim, maim his fellow, he shall be liable, which means you don't need any of the other details, do you? No. I mean, you've stated it already. So now we've stated it more than one time. So Rashi describes it as a following thing in Gemara in 85a. Okay. What does he say? The injurer must pay for actual damage, for example, the loss of a limb. What we mean is a loss of a limb is actually either the uh, limb gets lost because it has to be severed off. Okay. You sound, are you with me? You sound like you're falling asleep. Are you okay? Um, the one is the actual loss of a limb, like in war, and the other one is loss of use of a limb, which is tantamount to the same thing to a certain extent. The loss of a physical limb is worse than a loss of use of a limb. Why? If you're going on a shidduch and you're known as uh, one leg Lenny, <laughs> your chances of getting a, a marriage proposal are less than... Uh, um, you know, um, somebody that's carrying around a normal physiology that just doesn't have use of it. Are you with me? So in the market dating value, it is um, it is considered higher damage when you actually physically look odd. If it affects your job opportunity or your shidduch opportunities. If you're already married, you're miserable with your wife and so she now can be miserable with you. It might not have a financial implication. I don't know. But there certainly is the difference between aesthetic uh, effect on panosa or shidduch potential and actual loss of limb. How those calculations worked out, we're going to look at the latter chapters. So Rashi is saying as follows, where the injury must pay for the actual damage, for example, a loss of a limb, one might have thought that his payment is tantamount to having purchased that limb, and it was therefore his to sever in any manner even one that causes the victim pain. So these, this seems like, when you read it at first, like a very cruel sort of a, a, a um, synopsis. Not Rashi. Rashi is kind. I'm saying just the way that the description is given. But as, as we said the other day, that was not recorded. If you think about World War I, uh, people fought in the trenches. They got something called trench foot, which was when infection set in green... Uh, they had huge rats, you know, they could, uh, in those days, I mean, the rats were big, they could bench press little children, they were so big, and you had all sorts of diseases from the rats, uh, like the bubonic plague, believe me, it was hectic, so what happened is that if you had a wound, uh, you'd get, it would get septic, you'd get all sorts of diseases, and many cases, they'd have to amputate, so then the government, you had the cripple, a triple alliance. I said cripple. I'm thinking of a leg being severed. Scratch cripple. The triple alliance and the triple entente, which are your two, two sides of war. I was going to say cripple alliance. Sorry, I was on that mindset. So anyway, the guy will be crippled, but that's a different issue. So you had the triple alliance that what would happen is if somebody got severed in war, that they would have to pay for the damage that that would cause to one of the soldiers. Soldiers, whether that they would pay a full amount or a paltry, tiny amount, I don't know. So a soldier was your property and therefore you pay for your property. A soldier is the property of the state. Fine. Now you want to sue and you want to say that you need to pay, be paid for the pain compensation. The military is going to laugh at you or the government. They're not really going to take it seriously. So, um, so, but they should halachically pay for it because what Rashi is saying here is just because they own the limb, in other words, they've paid you for the damage, so you've been compensated, doesn't mean that they can put a sock in your mouth and say, listen, we own the limb. This is going to hurt a lot, but because we've paid for the limb, we don't have to pay for the anesthetic to sever it, and we can take our time, like, like playing on a violin, while you're gently Jeez. enjoying your time, take that limb off and saw while we chat to our mates. You think they never did that in the American Civil War is put a stick in someone's mouth and gently sawed the limb. What, they, what, 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 what does cost money is extra, extra anesthetics, etc. 
So what it's saying here is just because you've purchased the limb, in other words, you've paid for the damage of the, that limb, doesn't mean it's yours to uh, sever in any way, meaning that if it costs more money for an anesthetic, that you shouldn't pay to have that limb removed where need be in the kindest possible way, or pay an mm -hmm. equivalent of a compensation for pain caused. So Rashi is saying from here we learn both, that you have to pay for actual damage, which is literal, as well as from the Gezeira Shava for the pain aspect, and it's not either or. All right, so let's go on. I hope I've made that clear so far, guys. The rabbis, um, agree, do the rabbis agree with him? Yeah, well, that's the, the Rashi describes exactly what's in the Gomorrah, and I think that's a good point you're making, but of course they do. That's exactly in the Gomorrah itself. He yeah, just that, used... That's actually the answer. That, Great. Yeah, yeah, he just used the actual analogy to bring it to life. Oh, um, but, of course, it's mentioned in the Gomorrah. It says, learn from this, uh, the superfluous verse, two things, that pain is paid even where damage is paid, and the person is always liable for the damage he inflicts, even if it's unintentional. Fine. Now, what the Gomorrah is going to do in this particular case... Um, is uh, we're going to talk uh, about uh, a series of culpabilities, right? According to a lack of awareness in various degrees. So the first thing that we're going to talk about, guys, is a state of complete unawareness. And then we're going to get to a stage where you're more aware and more aware and see where the laws actually fit in. Does that make sense? So the first uh, case that we're going to do, Gav, uh, is a case where you are sleeping and somebody puts a stone in your lap, okay? And you're sleeping in a bunk bed, perhaps. And there are people underneath on a Shabbaton that are sleeping below you. You've all crashed. You've gone to um, Mayron or you've gone to one of these like sort of things for a Shabbaton in Sfat, where everybody like shares like double beds or triple beds and you go away for the weekend. So somebody has put, while you're sleeping, a stone in your lap. Now, this is the least level of awareness that you have. Why? Why, Kevin, is it the least amount of awareness? Why does it bring this case first? Kev? Someone's asleep. Is that what you're saying? They don't notice? Is it? Uh... Yes, I'm going to present it now and then ask you the question. You're not, you're not in the state of unconsciousness. Okay, almost. so more, more than that. The Gemara now presents a series of rulings by Rabbi. Okay, concerning a person's liability in cases of lack of awareness uh, to varying degrees. So Rabbi is an absolute genius. So why he did this in the Gomorrah is he wanted to show how the cases are actually applied by saying this is a person that's the least aware to the most aware. And I think the way Rabbi does it is he takes very complicated concepts and explains them very simply because that's a genius of Rabbi. Okay. So what he says is, all right, here's the first case. A stone was lying in the lap. Uh, if a stone was lying in his lap and he had never been aware of it, uh, and he stood up and it fell from his lap, uh, then we're learning in regards to damages. So what do we mean if a stone was lying in his lap and he had never been aware of it? What we're discussing here is a very, very simple case, right? Another person placed the stone in his lap while he was sleeping, and he stood up after awakening, never realizing that there was a rock in his lap. That's according to Rabbeinu Yosanan in Sheta Mikubetes. Okay, so that's how he sets it up. You're sleeping, somebody thinks it's very funny to put a stone in your lap, and it's got certain implications. Right. See, now that we understand... Let's yeah. mention something quickly. So this is very different to when you go to a house, and when you go to sleep, you actually see the objects there, and then you move them because you see them. This guy's going to sleep, and he's not hes not aware. When he goes to sleep, the rock wasn't there. When he wakes up, all of a sudden, the rock's there. So he's, in my opinion, completely, uh, it's completely unintentional. I think that's a brilliant, brilliant point that Kev, uh, yeah. Gavin is making. Brilliant. Because Gavin noticed in the beginning of the Mishnah, he's awake today, he's, uh, and he can see that it holds, we obviously uh, hold somebody sleeping liable, why? Because before they go to bed, they can see these articles that are delicate and precious and expensive. And he's got to go to sleep and putting those articles safely away, knowing that once he falls asleep, he has no bodily control. 
And uh, Gavin's saying that this case, how could the person even be liable? Because the thing of it is, um, uh, firstly, when he went to sleep, he wasn't holding anything like a cup of tea or, or uh, empty mug or anything whatsoever. And this was done in a state of complete unawareness. So why should he be liable? So we're going to see his level of liability now. You must know that it's such a brilliant question that Tosfos actually uh, discusses this question. Tosfos. So when Gavin's on awareness where he talks about Tosfos, you must know Gavin chapped it. All right. No. Okay. So I'm going to read a little bit on in the Gemara, uh, and then uh, we're going to discuss how, how it actually works, okay? So... Uh, just remind me in about two minutes, I will discuss Tosfot Gap, but I want to only discuss it when it's relevant. But you're absolutely on the mark. I may have to go in so, a few minutes, uh, Damon. Uh, you got uh, a student's going to phone me. He's going to call me, but it's on silent. He'll call me when he arrives. He's coming here. Okay. Okay. All right. Rubbers. Okay. So, right. So, if a stone was lying in his lap and he'd never been aware of it because he was sleeping, for example, and somebody put it there and he stood up and it fell from his lap, then in regard to damages, in other words, the stone falling from his lap struck and injured somebody else. He is liable. So why is he liable? Well, let's just discuss this. Uh, can I say uh, something? Yeah, sure. Maybe his force caused it. If it just may have fallen off his lap, in the normal course of events, maybe it wouldn't have caused such a bit. Maybe it caused more damage because he lived, he got up from his chair or his bed and it caused it had, it had more force as compared to a stone falling, just falling off his lap. Maybe that's okay. Right. So, Kevin's mentioning something very good there. So, we're not talking about a guy that continues to sleep and turns around and then a stone falls. In that case, we can agree that he's. Uh, that it's he's much more unconscious than when he wakes up and gets up and the stone falls. That's a very, very good point. And based on that, uh, according to both the uh, Gavin as well as Kevin, you are responsible for both. Why? Because when a person sleeps and they turn over and they knock something off, they are not even awake and conscious and you still have to pay. But for the reason that Gavin said, why do you have to pay in that case? Because you should have put it away while you're awake. Now, Kevin's case is also strong. Why? Because the guy wasn't even aware, as Gavin said, and Kevin's concurring, that when you're asleep, that there was something put in your lap. So you shouldn't be responsible at all. So why is he responsible? I'm going to read this and I'm going to talk about it. I'm going to be done in two minutes, guys, with this part. Okay, so Rashi said, just as we have derived, one must pay for the damage he inflicts, even if he did so unintentionally and unwillingly. That's the halacha. So whether you're aware or whether you're not aware, it's the equivalent of, um, say, for example, your, your child gets in your car and releases your handbrake down. Now, the child's three. He's not aware of the car moving or whatever, but your car goes out the driveway and claps your neighbor's car. Now, if a car hit your car from a neighbor, you're not really particularly uh, concerned whether uh, he planned three weeks in advance to hit your car because you wouldn't lend him that lawnmower or his child released the handbrake and his child uh, is still in nappies and smashed your car. Your car is smashed out of no fault of your own. And therefore you're liable for actual damage, but not the four other things. That was, that's what we learned because it wasn't intentional. So those explain that a person is liable even for a completely unavoidable mishap could explain that the stone falling from his lap is indeed such a mishap and he's still liable to damages that occurs. However, he's not liable to pay um, for the four other damages. Now, it's different as we said is, um, is, is if a case where one goes to sleep uh, and there's utensils next to him why? Because he should have put them away while conscious. This stone was placed in his lap when not. So it's saying even on the lowest state of awareness, you are responsible. Now, one question. Say a person goes to sleep and then the person home homeowner puts stuff next to his bed, like on the, on the top of the dressing table, you know, 
uh, puts it there, then the sleeping person is not responsible. So why in the case there's the sleeping person not responsible, but uh, here the person that uh, gets up and the stone falls from his lap, he is responsible. Okay. Two Tricky reasons. One. I, I, I think Kevin kind of no, got no, it. No, no, just hang on, Sorry. Kevin. I need to answer this because Kevin's got to go in two minutes. This. No, I need to look our phones. No, I can still cut into you. Okay. Um, sorry, Gav. I just we got to get through. No, this no, great. No, we got to finish. Damon, it depends. Is is which ruling is set in stone here? That's what you got to decide. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's very cute. So, um, all right. So, what what we're saying is as follows. Look, the the issues are different in two respects. The person that decides to damage their own stuff. By putting it next to a in the middle of a road or putting it next to a sleeping person can't have any legal claim against somebody else. Why? Because they did it to themselves. That's number one. That's what the sources say. Number two, uh, the person that got clapped by a stone below and got injured, say his eye was taken out. Okay, because it mentions the uh, so say a person's eye was taken out or tooth was not uh, was knocked out as a result. So in that case, why was the person below that got hit negligent? He wasn't negligent, Gavin. That's what it says in the Gomorrah. It's not the guy's fault that was sleeping behind, underneath. It's different when the guy puts his own utensils next to a sleeping person or next to a dog or next to the public road because he himself has damaged his own goods. Here the person the Gomorrah is saying is sleeping underneath. Uh, you can read the notes. Uh, is sleeping underneath, and he did nothing to cause the losing his eyes to, where the stone fell off and under his lap. Does that make sense? So why should he not recover his cost? That's number one. Number two, what, how, according to Tosfot, and Tosfot poses this question and answers it, he poses it a little bit like Gavin. Okay, so Gavin, I'm going to read it now. I'm sorry, I just want to get through this, and then you can ask any question you want. Sorry, Gavin. Just no, need to around a second. According to Torsforts, who holds that a person is liable for damage he inflicts unintentionally and unwillingly, only if there has been some element of negligence in his actions. Um, we must, um, so we must explain uh, that when he dropped the stone, he was completely unaware uh, of the stone being in his lap. And, and if Tosford says that there has to be some element of negligence, how is he negligent if, uh, if uh, he didn't go to sleep and was aware of that hazard? He went to sleep, somebody put something in his lap. So he has to be aware. Um, so according to Tosford, he wasn't aware. So why is he responsible? Tosford asks the question and Tosford answers the question. Uh, he asks it like Gavin and he answers it. What do you think the answer is, guys, before I give it to you? Take a stab at it. I would think he would say that he's, that he's not responsible and the guy who put the rock on him is the guy responsible. Okay. So, firstly, I think that's a great answer. We, it would be nice if I spoke to Rabbi Cohen to find out what the responsibility is of the guy that actually put the stone in his lap. Does that make sense? But uh, it might be that he's not responsible, according to some opinions, because he never caused the hazard. The hazard has to be caused directly. He merely set up the scenario. He didn't necessarily put it into swing. So there will be opinions, according to Gavin, and by the way, I totally agree that whoever put the stone in the person's lap is the one that is actually should be responsible. But according to those opinions, that turn around and say the person that causes the actual damage has to be responsible. Just like you've got, for example, somebody that orders a contract uh, hit on somebody, but the uh, in, in, in uh, based in, only the hitman is responsible and Shemayim, they're both responsible. There might be a difference in legal case, Gavin, according to who's responsible with the based in, according to who Shemayim holds responsible. Because we often talk about direct acts of responsibility. But Tosfork gives a wonderful answer to this. He said your default position when you wake up always. Okay. Just there we go. So I've got to go. One, 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 I need 30 seconds from you. Kev, 30 okay. seconds. Okay. 
Tosford is just saying that before. I'll be one second. Up, yeah. uh, before you get up, you need to check your lap. You can't just get up and spring out of bed. Yes. Something can go wrong. Check your. I'm coming now. So you say it again. Tosford is saying it's your responsibility when you wake up, not to not to do anything rash. You always check your body. You always check you don't have a sharp object near you, a heavy object. It's your default position when you get up to be aware of other human beings. And therefore your negligence of not checking yourself before you get up is you are partly responsible. And therefore you do have to pay actual damage and not the actual, the other four things. I wanted to make a comment. I uh, can't remember now, but it was important. What did you just end off with that? <clears throat> second? Kevin is 100% right to me. I think the person that put the rock in the lap is far more responsible. Mm. And it's, uh, so it says, in regard to damage as the stone falling from his lap that struck and injured somebody else, he is liable. Okay? Uh, we're not talking about liable for the full things, for other damages, because that is just, um, um, what do you call it? That is just, um, uh, if, it's, if it's purposeful. But what we've learned so far in the Gomorrah and Rashi is he's not only liable for the... Um, you see, this is what I don't understand. It says in regard to the other four things, he is not liable. But what, what I'm battling with that I need to speak to Rabbi Cohen about is that it just said in the Gomorrah above that we learn that you're liable for pain as well as actual damage. Now, if a brick falls off from somebody's uh, top bunk and they hit somebody else, that's going to be very painful, losing your tooth with the brick. So how can I say in the Gomorrah above that we learned from this Gezeira Shabbat, you have to pay for pain, and yet in the Gomorrah below, you only pay for the four, you don't pay for the four additional things, only the actual damage. So that's the first question I have for Rabbi Cohen. The second question I have for Rabbi Cohen is why don't we at least make the person that put the gas, uh, stone in the lap either fully responsible, half responsible, for th three quarters responsible. Maybe the guy's only a quarter responsible for not checking his lap. But I agree that the Kevin's right and you're right that they should never put the stone in the person's lap. Absolutely. And I'll tell you something. This was all written before benzodiazepines were invented. And I'll tell you something. When you wake up in the morning, you don't even know which country you're in. Never mind a stone. Yeah, 100% right. I mean, yeah. I don't know where I am. You know, I'm, I'm all whacked out. I battle to sleep. I have to take some stuff. So a lot of us do. So it's very, very tricky. Eh? It's... And I think maybe that's why they, uh, you've only got the one punishment. And uh, you don't have pain, you only have damages possibly. No, 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 Kevin. But the problem is if you're paying for actual damages, and that damage is worth 200 zoos, and it's not your fault, you were sleeping, you get up and the stone was yep. there, and you don't have the presence of mind to check your lap because you're groggy. And the person that puts the stone in your lap is not responsible at all. I'm bothered with that. No, I'm also bothered. I'm also bothered by the fact that on top it says in the Gomorrah you have to pay for pain and actual damage that we learned from the Gezeira Shava, and underneath you're paying only for actual damage and not the four other things, which would exclude pain. There seems to be a contradiction. I want to try and yeah, sort no, it out. Those are good questions. If, if, if you can come back to us, it will be great. Anytime. Thank you, David. All right, guys, you were on top form. And Arthur, you did the prep, which I really appreciated. Man. Yeah, it was just, it was kind of weird. Like, I, I, I thought I missed this morning. Let me quickly read through it. And as I'm reading through it, I'm saying, wait, I know this stuff. I did this before. I mean, I, I read through the, the, the B1, 2, and 3 uh, very quickly. But as I was reading it, I realized I'd done it already. So it did help, the prep I did before. It absolutely did help. Uh, all right, guys, I hope I gave it over okay. No, you're fantastic, Dan. You're no, great. No, no, very good. I appreciate you can the, upload. And I but appreciate you, James. I appreciate all your effort and everything you put in. We we do love you for all the work you do. No, 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 we do. It's a lot of effort, eh? Yeah. It's a lot but of I effort. Don't it's find it not a guy doing this full time, time, eh? As a conversation. I'm saying I hope you don't find it disrespectful. That no. I give it over accurately, but it's more of a conversation. Yeah. Than, is that better? It's oh, better. No, and you give my Give nice examples, Damon. You're very good. Okay, the uh, example came from Russian. Brilliant. And All right, okay. guys, have a lovely day. Yeah. Ciao, bye. Bye. Thank you.